Hello, my name is Nathan Brummel, and I want to talk to you today about one of my favorite post-Reformation theologians, Pierre du Moulin. If you live today, I suppose we will call him, in English, Peter du Moulin. He was a French Reformed defender of the doctrines of grace. He's one of my favorite post-Reformation theologians. You might say, well, I've never heard of him before. Well, the reason for that is that he lived many years ago, and he had influence on the French Reformed Church, and he wrote most of his books in French and in Latin. And alas, you might not be able to read either French or Latin. Pierre du Moulin lived from 1568 to 1658. So he lived a long life for someone in those days. He lived to the ripe old age of 89. Pierre du Moulin was famous in his day, even though you might never have heard about him. He was an internationally famous Reformed theologian, and he defended the French Reformed churches from dangers without and dangers within. He faithfully defended the Reformed churches in France against Roman Catholicism. And you can even scarcely begin to imagine the sensitive nature of that because he lived in the time after the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. And he was at the center of things. He was a pastor in a church in Paris, or on the very outskirts of Paris. Today we'd say it's one of the suburbs of Paris. In the time following the Edict of Nantes, and prior to the French Reformed Church being eradicated by the Roman Catholics in France. So he lived at a very dangerous time for a French Reformed believer. And what a sensitive situation was that he was in, and he was a fearless defender of the doctrines of grace even though it led him to suffer greatly, even to suffer from depression. He not only was internationally famous for his defending of the Reformation over against the Roman Catholics and their semi-Pelagian views of salvation, but he also defended the Reformed churches from dangers within. In fact, he wrote one of the most important books against Jacobus or Jacobus Arminius called An Anatomy of Arminianism. That book was even read at the Synod of Dort. He also was involved in taking issue with a semi-Arminian theologian who was, unbelievably enough, a French Reformed pastor and theologian, Moses Amorat. So, Pierre de Moulin was famous in his day for his polemics against Roman Catholicism, for his very public debates with Roman Catholic leaders, while the King of France himself was present for the debates. But today he's mostly famous for his challenge of the hypothetical universalism of Moses Amorout in France. Now in his own day, of course, he was also famous as a defender of Calvinism or the doctrines of grace, Augustinianism, over against the Remonstrants in the Netherlands. But alas, his book, the Anatomy of Arminianism is probably not read very much today because it's only in an old English translation that's a bit hard to read. Pierre du Moulin was one of the post-Reformation theologians and he knew that the Reformation was right when they re rediscovered the doctrines of grace in the sacred scriptures, the doctrines of free, gracious justification, the doctrine of the supremacy of God in election, and he knew, of course, as Luther and Calvin did, that the Bible in places like Romans 8, Romans 9, and Ephesians 1, and elsewhere taught the doctrine of the sovereignty of God in salvation and the nature of the divine decrees. The pre-reformers even, as well as the magisterial reformers, all realized that the Bible taught what Augustine had taught centuries ago, that God predestined certain individuals to life purely of his sovereign good pleasure. And the Reformers rejected the semi-Pelagian idea that the Roman Catholics were teaching, which was that God chose people due to foreseen faith. Now, Pierre de Moulin is a forgotten post-Reformation theologian. Even though Mark Larson calls Pierre de Moulin one of the great doctors of the Reformed world in the first half of the 17th century. Roger Nicole said that his stature outranked that of his theological contemporaries, as Lewis 
or Louis XIV outranks most other kings of France before and after him. Brian Armstrong, who is no friend of Pierre Dumoulin's Calvinism, his consistent Calvinism, wrote that Dumoulin was incontestably the leading ministerial voice of the French Protestant Church in the first half of the 17th century. Emile Lenard calls him "ce grand intellectual. Gideon Gorey ranks him as the greatest of the doctors among the post-Reformation theologians. So the question is, why do American Christians know so little about him? I suppose that along the east coast of the United States where many French Reformed Huguenots immigrated when they had to flee from France, he probably is more widely known, but even there many of the French Reformed churches became assimilated with other churches in the United States, like the Presbyterians or the Dutch Reformed. Simonetta Carr recently wrote an article in which she called Dumoulin a patriarch of the French Reformation. I think there's a play of words. There's two good reasons why he should be called the patriarch. One is that he had a spiritual and theological impact on many ministers. Although, alas, as time went on, unfortunately, many Reformed ministers bought into the teachings of the semi-Arminian Moses Amarout, in spite of the influence of Pierre du Moulin. But he's also called a patriarch because he had many children. Maybe you came from a large family. I came from a family of five. My mother came from a Dutch family of 12. My dad a family of eight. Well, Pierre de Moulin outdid that. He himself had 18 children. With two wives, as we will see. Well, let's talk about the life of Pierre de Moulin and his childhood. He was born into the French nobility. He was born October 18 in the year 1568, which means that he was only four years old when the French Reformed Roman Catholics murdered Reformed believers on a mass scale on a day that lives in infamy. FDR said that the date of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor is a date that lives in infamy. Well, for the Reformed churches, St. Bartholomew's Day, which is August 24, 1572, is a date that lives in infamy. And so shall it for all eternity. At that time, Pierre de Moulin was only four years old, and he might have been murdered on that day when tens of thousands of Reformed Protestants were murdered. The killing began in Paris with the murder of Admiral Coligny, and then many others. There were so many murdered in Paris that the river, the Seine, flowed red with their blood. And then the murder spread to other regional cities. Before it was done, tens of thousands of Reformed believers were murdered. But God used the means of a Roman Catholic woman hiding the little boy under a straw mattress to protect him from assassins. And then a servant girl hid the little boy under her skirt and saved his life in the providence of God. God didn't want this little boy to die. In fact, this little boy would live a long life. God ordained that he would not be called home to glory until many years later in 1658 when he would pass away at the age of 89. His father took the family, his father was a pastor, and fled to Sedan, which was an independent principality to the northeast of Paris. And he got there with the help of a duke, and there the boy lived in Sedan until he was 19 years old. His dad was a Protestant pastor named Joachim du Moulin. His mother, Frances Gabet, died soon after the family fled to Sedan. Perhaps from exhaustion after the stress of the aftermath of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, and the fact that her father, Innocent Gabet, was among the tens of thousands of Reformed believers who had been murdered. The boy studied in the Protestant College and Academy at Sedan, but then when he turned 19, his father was running out of money to support his son, and so he sent the boy to Paris and left him with an inheritance of sorts, all he could do to maintain him, which was just 12 gulden. But the boy found that it was dangerous for a reformed man to be in Paris, and so Pierre fled from his homeland to spend four years in London. 
Now this some, was something very typical of Reformed believers in those days. Calvin, remember, had been a Frenchman who had to flee from Paris. Theodore Beza, when he became a Protestant, had to flee from Paris. And Pierre finds that things are too hot in Paris, and so he moves to England, and there he, there he becomes the tutor to the children of the Duke of Rutland. And there he went with his students to Cambridge and Oxford universities, where he was able to listen to the lectures of William Whitaker, a Puritan theologian. While he was in London attending the French Reformed Church there, one of the pastors encouraged him to use his gifts as a preacher. And he began to experience a call to the ministry, and so he preached his first sermon in a Huguenot church, or Huguenot church, located in London. Pierre then returned to the continent, but he went to a safe place, which was the Netherlands. And he went to Leiden University in the Netherlands, where he studied under Franciscus Junius, who was one of the great defenders of the doctrines of grace. Now his trip back across the English Channel was dangerous. In fact, he was even hurled out of his ship as it crossed the English Channel. He did lose his luggage, but God spared his life. When he arrived in the Netherlands, through a little poem that he wrote about his experiences, he made contact with some of the French Reformed believers who were in the Netherlands, and a French princess introduced him at the Dutch court. And through the influence of some people, he was asked to teach logic at Leiden University and then logic and Greek at the Staten College. Then he was asked to teach philosophy and Greek at Leiden University, which, remember, in those days was one of the great Protestant universities in Europe. It was due to his highborn status and his cultivation that he was able to develop personal ties with people in high positions. He didn't feel like a fish out of water when he was around people of the higher class. In fact, later on, he would become close to James I, the King of England, and would function as an advisor to him. He would also be a chaplain to the French King Henry IV. Pierre was present to witness a very striking event in Dutch history. He was present at Groningen in 1594 when Prince Maurice conquered the city and ended Spanish rule in the Netherlands. Remember how the Spanish under Duke Alva had terribly persecuted the Reformed believers, and so the Reformed had been fighting a battle for their independence and for their religious freedom. Well, finally, the tyranny of Spanish rule was over, and Pierre Dumoulin was there to see the Netherlands free. Well, the young man, man didn't stay in the Netherlands for too much longer because the Edict of Nantes affected the life of this young man. What happened is that in 1598, Henry IV, the King of France, ratified the Edict of Nantes. This would allow freedom for French Protestants to worship in certain cities. The French Reformed had been fighting for their very existence against the Roman Catholic majority in France. There had been wars of religion. And this edict allowed the French Reformed to worship legally in French towns. But at this time, the French Reformed churches lacked preachers. So in 1598, this promising young man, this Frenchman, returned to France, and there he was ordained to become a pastor. It was December of 1598. The next year, the young man became one of the pastors at the Huguenot Church that was in Ablon, just 10 miles from Paris. And then he was involved in something that was truly courageous. He helped this church to relocate only one mile from Paris in Charenton. And the church there built a large building, which for some reason the French Reformed called a temple. They called their church buildings temples. And here he would preach for more than 20 years, from 1599 to 1620. This church would remain a strong center of confessional reform theology. theology. And their pastor was well known for his holy eloquence. And wedding bells rang. The young pastor married Marie Collignon, a woman of high rank, in 1598. God blessed their marriage with eight children, and Dumoulin described his first wife as a rare example of piety, zeal, and charity towards the poor. 
He said that she lived as one must die. She looked at things here below as one must see them from heaven. So he had a wonderfully spiritually minded wife. At this time, Catherine of Bourbon, who was the sister of Henry IV, so she's a very important person in France, appointed Dumoulin to be her personal chaplain because she personally held to reform theology. So you can only begin to understand the influence that Pierre Dumoulin is having in high circles in France. He would spend two months of each year carrying out his duty as chaplain to this princess, to Catherine. Also due to the grace given to him, he engaged in public debates with Roman Catholic theologians. This was such a sensitive time in France, but he defended the Reformation over against the dominant Roman Catholicism. In fact, when he would be involved in debates, 3,000 people would come to these public debates, including the French king. He debated a man named Palma Cayet in 1602 when this Roman Catholic tried to convert Catherine of Bourbon, the princess, to Roman Catholicism. He also debated De Balu about the Mass and the doctrine of the Church. He debated a Jesuit at a different time. He also debated with the Armenians. When he learned about the Armenian threat in the Netherlands and the writings of Jacobus Arminius, as well as the teachings of the Remonstrants, he wrote his Anatomy of Arminianism. It's entitled in the Latin, Anatomy Arminianismi. It was published in Leiden in 1619. Now, as the Synod of Dort was being set up, the French Reformed were asked to send delegates. Well, Pierre Dumoulin was one of the men who was delegated by the French Reformed churches to attend the Synod of Dort, but the French king would not allow him or his colleague to go. Well, his book he wrote against Arminianism allowed him to address the issue publicly, and his book is read in open session at the Synod of Dort. This book is a book that has been forgotten by too many. It's a, it's a book that takes some challenges to read because it's in Old English. It was translated to Old English, but the biggest problem there is that all of the S's look like F's because that's how they wrote S's in those days if the S was in the middle of a word. Now, today, Pierre Dumoulin is best known for his debates against Moses Amarout and the school of Saumur. The School of Summer was a reform seminary in France. It was located in the city of Saumur. Amarout and the school taught a hypothetical universalism. Now, we're going to talk about this a little more in the future, but at this point, we just want to say that they claimed that prior to God's decree of unconditional election, that he had an antecedent decree to elect all human beings conditional on them believing in Jesus. So, he held to some type of universal conditional election of all. The Amaraldians also claimed that Jesus' atonement was not limited to the elect, but that Jesus died potentially for all human beings, conditional on them believing in him. And therefore, he claimed that Jesus died for all and taught a version of a universal atonement. 